you know, everyone should see the little message and we are ready to go. So Stefan, over to you. Thanks, Fred, for the introduction. <clears throat> so just as a super brief um, recap, yesterday we introduced pattern, pattern shows or more precisely the pseudocore factor from first principle. And we derived the generic form of the uh, radiator function or the hard matrix element, if you will, in the semi-classical approximation. So today we're going to look at the geometric properties of this function, which are rather intriguing. <clears throat> so let's jump right in. There's a lot to do. Just as a reminder from yesterday, this was the function that we derived and it came from taking, well, I don't know what's going on now. Um, it came from taking a semi-classical current, contracting it with some polarization vector and uh, essentially squaring that, okay? So now there is an interesting thing to note about this function. Let me just remove what I wrote here. <clears throat> if I take the numerator, um, I can write this if all the particles are massless as EA times EB times one minus cos theta between A and B. And I can, in a similar vein, write down the denominator functions. And what I note is that the energies will cancel between the numerator and the denominator. Um, the energies of A and B, and only the energy of C will remain. So that's an important property, and it will come back to us later, or it will come back to haunt us later. <clears throat> and the only other thing that remains is this function W that I noted here. And this is a purely angular function, okay? So it only consists of the opening angles between the radiating color dipole as a reminder we had a particle a that zips along on some trajectory gets a kick at some point and we could discuss in the recitation session yesterday what this kick might mean so it can be for example deep analytic scattering where that kick actually comes from the scattering of an electron right on a nucleus um, or um, a nucleon um, okay I pull a quark out of the proton, there's some remnant. That is my particle that zips along with momentum PA. It gets a kick from the virtual photon here. And then it changes its momentum to PB. Okay, so that's the physics picture we are talking about, right? But it could be any other old process that you imagine. Um, it could also be charge current deep elastic scattering for that matter. Or you flip the process around and it's a plus or minus uh, to two jets or you flip the process again and you get Drelia Metron pair production. Okay, so this radiator is valid for all those cases. And why is the radiator valid for all those cases? Well, because that function W only cares about the opening angles. So this angle here is very sketchy and the opening angle between these two particles. <clears throat> and when you now radiate a gluon, which is the thing that is described by this function. So we describe essentially this block but it's not quite true. We try, we describe the coherent radiation of the gluon from both of the charges. And that is given by this radiator function and that one over EC term there, okay? And that only cares about this angle theta AB and also cares about the angle um, between uh, these two guys, which would be theta BC and about the angle, okay, that is impossible to draw for me now because I made a stupid picture between A and C, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> okay, so the important property here is that this function is divergent as the angle between A and C goes to zero and as the angle between B and C goes to zero. Okay, these are the collinear divergences that you find in your quantum field theory um, or gauge field theory rather. Now, we would like to disentangle those two singularities because whenever you have a combined singularity in, in one or the other theory, it's not so nice to deal with. Uh, we would like to make things very explicit and have only individual singularities um, isolated in, a, in certain functions, they are easier to integrate. <clears throat> so what we do is we add a zero and we split this radiator into two parts that are called W tilde. And in the superscript on this W tilde, we uh, sorry, we indicate the particle uh, with uh, which this particular for which this particular radiator describes a singular region. Okay, 
So this is the zero that I was adding. It's only a zero if you combine the this w tilde and this w tilde, because uh, this term in the one with the superscript a will cancel this term in the one with the superscript b and the other way around. Okay. But it's rather convenient to write it this way because now this function is divergent only as theta a c goes to zero and not as theta b c goes to zero. And it's even more convenient because it has super nice properties when you integrate over the azimuthal angle. What do I mean by azimuthal angle? Well, take the picture from the previous slide. I, I choose a coordinate system where my z-axis lies along the direction of a. <clears throat> and then I have an opening angle theta AC here, theta AB here, and I have an angle theta BC here. Now it's important to realize that this is two dimensional and the angle theta BC has to be composed from the polar angles theta, theta B and theta C, which are effectively these theta AB and theta AC that I, that I noted here, okay? And some azimuthal angle, and that's the angle here. Okay, simply because C and B can point into different directions in the transverse plane well, with respect to this axis here. Okay, and then if I perform an azimuthal averaging over this function um, by means of this integral, I find that it is one over one minus cosine theta C. Um, so the opening angle here, <coughs> if and only if, um, theta c is less than theta b. Okay, what does that mean? It means whenever this new particle c is radiated at smaller angles than the original opening angle between what we call the emitting dipole, um, which is given by the directions of the particle before the kick and after the kick, <coughs> um, only then do I actually get any kind of singularity or anything at all, because in the other cases, my radiation pattern is zero. So that's very nice because this is the most basic manifestation of something that we call angular ordering. The opening angle between A and C must be smaller than the opening angle between A and B. <clears throat> and this is not only valid for a single emission, but it's also valid for multiple emissions. And we will go through this in a minute. Okay, let's visualize this. We plot everything in a plane where I put, sorry for the nomenclature here, I took this plot from somewhere else, uh, where I put theta c here and I put theta b here. <clears throat> and what we find is that the function has support only in the region uh, where theta c is larger than theta b. This is what I have in this condition up here. Well, not quite true actually, because I also see something below that region. I also see something here. But what happens is that upon azimuthal averaging, I have a positive contribution from this region and I have an, the same size negative contribution uh, from a different azimuthal area or a different azimuthal region. And when I put them both together, um, they become the zero. So keep this in the back of your head because what we see here is that angular ordering holds on average, okay? So whenever you have an observable that is capable of resolving the azimuthal structure of this radiation by probing the transverse region in great detail, then you will break this um, plus minus correspondence in the, in the words of yesterday, where we also analyzed the real virtual correspondence, you will break the unitarity basically. And you will be able to distinguish um, kind of the left side from the right side. And then it's not only important to get this upper half plane right by means of angular ordering, but it's also important to get the lower half plane right. And these observables are called non, <coughs> sorry, non-global observables. Okay, they are capable of um, resolving these things for some of those guys. Okay, actually, are there questions on this? Because that's a very important point. You can, I should say again, um, if you have questions, just raise your hand at any point. I'm not always having my eyes on the on the participant list. Rock, yes. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, so I think we're assuming currently that the additional emission 
for which angular ordering holds is soft. I've heard it also works for hard emissions. Um, is that obvious from what we've discussed? We can also save this for the recitation session if it's too long. No, so that's something we should discuss during the recitation session. Angular ordering is, is almost exclusively always um, derived only for the eye column, right? So only for this radiator that I derived yesterday. You're right about that, yes. Um, it can be used also for the collinear region because when you are interested in the next to leading log logarithmically accurate radiation pattern, um, then what you do with the collinear region is to a large extent arbitrary. And I'll get back to that um, later on in the lecture. And we can also discuss it during the recitation session. Uh, is that helpful now? Or? It is, yes, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, and if there are more questions, anyone just raise your hand. Um, I think Fred and Frank will, will keep their eyes on the, on the participant list and remind me if I don't see it. Okay, <clears throat> there's a different thing that you could do with this radiator function. And sorry for the change in notation here, I just copied this from a different uh, talk. Um, so A and B change to I and K and C changes to J, but I think we can, uh, we can just use this picture here um, to identify who is who. So you can partial fraction this radiator um, as so, okay? And this is just mathematical trick. Basically, at this point, there's no physics behind it, but it is very convenient um, because what you see here in front is a term that you recognize. It's just essentially a propagator. So if um, I and J are massless, I can write this as um, two over the virtuality of these guys. So I can identify this in physics terms with a propagator for this intermediate particle which is uh, the progenitor, if you will, of these two final state particles, or the, the ancestor, the mother, as we call it in the shower uh, terminology. And here, the assignment is a little different. You get a different term. So you have something that corresponds to this intermediate particle. And in that way, you have easily matched this expression to the collinear limit. Because if you write the other function here, the remainder in suitable coordinates, you get something that looks like one over one minus z times some smallish corrections, which we can talk about later, maybe in the recitation session. Um, so this looks very much like the leading part of the splitting function that we discussed yesterday. Okay, And this guy um, is the one over t that we encountered in, the, in yesterday's lecture. Okay, and then you're missing only the phase-based vectors. So that's a super convenient Lorentz invariant formulation of what's going on. It's also easy to integrate and use in, as a next to leading order infrared subtraction, which is something that Simon talked about in his lecture yesterday. Um, and this is why people really like to use it. And the original paper that suggested this is a paper by Mike and uh, Stefano Catani, uh, it's quoted here. So seemingly an ideal formulation of the antenna radiation, it also has the other nice property that it's actually positive definite. Whereas this guy here, as we saw, is not positive definite everywhere. Um, but the theory is still abelian. Um, so let's have a closer look. Let's look at what happens for non-abelian theories. So I just remind you yesterday, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to the generators of SU3. Right, I just said, okay, we radiate something. I don't care uh, whether these guys interact again. Okay, so now we emit two blue ones. Um, and the notation gets a little bit more complicated, but it's not that hard. So we have a QQ bar pair that we start from, and we have two blue ones that we emit. And I change notation again. Sorry for that. Uh, but let me draw it into this graph here. Uh, so you should visualize this as a cut. Diagram. So this is something like a virtual photon goes to a QQ bar pair with indices i and j. Okay. And then you emit two gluons. One gluon gets index one and the other gluon gets index two. Okay, that's my notation now. And the other side of this, this guy here, is just um, corresponds just to well, writing an amplitude here and writing the complex conjugate amplitude here. So in the end, this whole guy is a contribution to some matrix element square, okay? Does that make sense? 
If it doesn't make sense, shout, um, let me know. Um, so what happens here is that I have one particular graph on the left-hand side that interferes with a different graph where the gluons are emitted from a different quark line on the other side, okay? And it turns out that what we calculated yesterday, um, the factor PA times PB over PA, PC, PC, PB, <clears throat> um, which now turns into PIPJ over PIP1, P1, PJ for the first emission is just related to this interference type diagram where the gluon is emitted here and absorbed on the, in the complex conjugate amplitude on the other side, okay? So this is the picture um, for these graphs, at least in the soft limit. And some of you uh, will have encountered this already in your work. <clears throat> and if you didn't um, think about this, we will also discuss this in the recitation session because this is very important. Um, I was trying to stress this several times already. This is what you should take away from this lecture that this radiation pattern is generic. Okay, you can also write down the color factors for this diagram and the color factors always come for the diagram squared. So here for, for the first diagram, we have this um, color factor, which is a combination of CA and CF. For this, um, for this other type of diagram, where the gluon is emitted of a quark line and reabsorbed at a gluon, because it's absorbed at a gluon, we have a different color factor that comes only with the A over two. And the thing that I encourage you to discuss in the recitation session with the lecturer is where, where does this structure emerge, okay? I mean, what's the, what's the mechanism where the two terms come from? You don't need to calculate, but you can think about where the, what the mechanism is. Okay, the kinematics factors are slightly different between the two. For the first, we essentially have the square of what I was sketching here, okay? And for the second, um, you can think about how this emerges um, and discuss it in the recitation session. If I put both of them together, I get this expression up here where I factor out the first emission, which looks very much, sorry, I changed notation again. I'm just abbreviating things with this SIJ factor here, which is just a shorthand for the scalar product. So I can fit everything nicely on one line. Um, so I pull out the contribution from the first emission and um, then these two guys here correspond um, to diagrams that have a triple gluon vertex in them. And this guy here corresponds to what I call the cross box diagram, okay? Where these gluons don't interact, whereas here they interact, okay? Now, there are two important limits for these matrix elements. One is the large MC limit, in which case only the first term survives. And the abelian limit, in which case only the second term survives, um, but only with the color factor CF squared. So this is a way to cleanly separate the color factors. It looks nice and simple, um, but what have we actually learned? Well, let's come up with a tool to visualize what's happening. And this tool is called the Lund plane. Lund after this, the, the nice city of Lund in southern Sweden, where lots of Monte Carlos are produced. Um, so the way the Lund plane is defined is I take a um, particle, which is one of my radiators typically, uh, which flies in the Z direction. And then I take another particle, both are massless, which fly, flies in the minus Z direction. <clears throat> Then I measure the transverse momentum of any of the emissions that I create, in this case, P1, with respect um, to the axis that is defined by these two guys. Okay, that's my Lund PT. And I can also define the frame in which these guys um, have, well, the center of mass frame of I and J, right? And then I can measure the rapidity of the emission in that frame. And if I write my momentum P1 in a Sudakov decomposition with a plus component, a minus component, and this transverse component. As a reminder, plus and minus are just defined as E plus or minus PZ, so there is no secret behind this. Um, then you can easily see that the uh, momentum squared is just what I wrote down here. And in particular, if the momentum is massless, we have the very convenient relation that the transverse part is just the same as P plus times P minus, okay? 
I can also use my momentum i and j up here because they were massless as projectors in order to extract the minus component or the plus component of the momentum. And because um, I have this nice relation, I can put both of them together. And when I do so, I find, um, hold and behold, that PT squared is nothing but this term. And you recognize this term from the previous slide. This is just one over the matrix element squared. Okay, this is why these coordinates are so convenient. Okay, now we can rewrite the rapidity um, using this transverse momentum. Um, and if we consider a branching process where we have um, two momenta, which by means of an on-shell shift that we discussed yesterday go into three momenta, and I consider the phase space boundaries, I can say that this um, invariant mass here is smaller or equal to the original invariant mass. And this um, um, certainly has similar properties. So in the end, I can derive that my rapidity is bounded from above by one half times the logarithm of the original invariant mass of the emitting color dipole given by this pi tilde and pj tilde divided by pt squared, and then the same on the other side. So now I have something very neat. I can also write down that the phase space is proportional to dpt squared d eta. We will do this as an exercise. We figured the matrix element is just a one over pt squared. So if I put this together with this, I get the radiation probability. And I find that the radiation probability goes logarithmically in pt squared. I just put this guy together with this guy and flat in rapidity. Okay. And I have these boundaries. Now let's assemble everything. Um, I would like to plot in log pt squared because that's how my radiation probability goes. Um, I would have to have some account of rapidity. And the way this is usually put is you put eta on the x-axis or on the abscissa, um, and you put uh, log pt squared on the y-axis, the ordinate. Um, and then you get the Lund plane. And because you have these boundaries, the available region that a part shell can radiate in is bounded by the diagonals in the Lund plane, and everything goes into the negative um, direction. Negative because um, we have log pt squared over s, so that's always a number smaller than one. So the pattern shower can fill this region. And because the matrix element was proportional to one over pt squared, your radiation probability is a constant in the long plane. That's why so, it's so convenient to, to visualize this in the long plane. Any question on this? Yeah, I don't see any at the moment, so let's move on. Um, so if I take that leading color approximation in the Lund plane, I essentially find that, okay, I, I tried to color code this here, so you see the difference between CA and, uh, and CF, um, but it's really just saying that any particle radiates with CA over two, okay, that's why this guy has a different color. What also happens in that, okay, I should discuss this here, when you have a an emission at some point in the Lund plane, let's say at any given transverse momentum, let's say at this point, it will be at a certain rapidity, let's say here. And at that point, you're opening more phase space because now you can, radi you can have radiation from the original color dipole, which was given by um, I and J. And you can also have radiation from a new dipole, um, which is given by, um, well, either of the two, basically. So you have your split your original color dipole here in the leading color picture into two color dipoles. And this should manifest itself somehow in the Lund plane. And the way this is drawn usually is that there's a new triangle that opens up here that sticks out from this original Lund back plane. Why is a single triangle that sticks out from the back plane enough? Well, because it has two sides. So if I put the face base together, so I kind of flip the back side over, I get the same face base as for my original triangle. Right? It's just smaller because it starts at some smaller value of transfer momentum. And then if I have more emissions, I can have them from here. For example, a new triangle sticks out. I can also have a new emission from here. Um, and um, anybody guess what this will become with multiple emissions?
So this guy will become a fractal. Um, it will have a fractal structure. Um, it's just like um, the Mandelbrot sequence, basically. If you measure the bottom uh, line or the, um, of, this, um, of this thing here, you can calculate the scaling dimension of this fractal. And this, uh, this scaling dimension is connected to some anomalous dimensions in QCD, obviously, because this is how we derive this. It must be connected somehow. The question how it's connected, you can discuss in the recitation session. Um, you can ask your, um, your lecturers um, uh, about this. OK, so now let's look at um, how this, um, um, sorry, what happens in the single emission case or in the double emission case. I already said for our large MC limit, we get the guy emitting with, uh, or both guys emitting with a color factor CA both the original dipole and then the new dipole that we form, which uh, defines this little triangle here after we have the first emission, okay? And um, uh, for the abelian limit, um, we get both guys radiating with CF, which doesn't make a lot of sense because one is a dual. Um, so what is the reality actually? Well, to see what's reality, we actually have to work a little bit harder. We have to take the full matrix element and split it into the functions W tilde that I introduced before that uh, single out the divergences in the collinear region only, but not in the anti-collinear region. I can do this as shown on the slides. So I take the term that was proportional to CF, I split it into a W tilde, there's all, um, with an upper index um, superscript I, there's also one with the superscript J that is hidden in here. Correspondingly, there is also a guy with the superscript J in here um, that is also hidden in here, okay? So I essentially sort the terms by the superscripts. Um, and there is one term um, that, um, that doesn't get a superscript, that is this guy, okay? Now I rewrite this, uh, sorry, that also gets a superscript, but there's no uh, corresponding term in the um, in this bracket here. Okay. Um, okay, so now I define a new function, which is the difference between two of these radiators. Sorry, there's a, this should be a tilde, not a bar. I correct this in the, in the online version of the slides. And I put everything together. What I then obtain is this radiation pattern. Um, there are only positive contributions here, this, this, and this, which is not quite true because this guy is, has a minus sign here and there are also minus signs in the W tilde. but it still has convenient properties upon azimuthal integration. Um, as a matter of fact, the azimuthally integrated function W bar, and you can ask your, your lecturers in the, in the recitation session about this, um, vanishes, oh, oh sorry, why that is, um, vanishes if the angle between the originally emitting particle, let it be the guy that lives on this line, um, and the new emission that happens at any point or may happen at any point, so it could happen, for example, here. Okay, so this is my emission two, this is the emission one. Um, if that angle is smaller um, than the opening angle between the first emission and the original uh, guy and um, the opening angle between I and J, in other words, if these two are closer together than these two, uh, sorry, then uh, if, if this gluon two is closer to I, or is close enough to I that it cannot see one and J individually, that's the right way to phrase it, then this function will vanish. Okay, so this is dead. Um, on the other hand, we also have that the as smoothly integrated function W tilde with the superscript one vanishes if the angle between um, one and two, sorry, another mistake in the indices here, <laughs> is larger than the opening angle between I and one. So the consequence of uh, both of this is that if I have my second emission, as I said, kind of closer to um, the progenitor particle I, 
um, that it, or close enough to this progenitor particle i that it cannot resolve one and j individually, then both of these terms will be dead, and I only have a color factor CF left. That's the guy here. Okay. Um, so only this CF term will survive. And this is why the Lund plane that is drawn here is colored in this way, because if there is a new emission that comes, even if it comes from the dipole, okay, let me let me sketch this here again. So I have I and J, there's a color dipole between them, okay? Uh, or they form a color dipole. After the emission of one, I split this dipole into two dipoles. And now you would think, okay, somewhere there must be an account of the fact that this gluon should radiate with CA over two. And somewhere there must be an account of the fact that this quark radiates with CF. And the question is, how is the split between the two? And what we find is that if the gluon in the original center of mass frame of the event is closer to the quark, it, radiate, it, it gets emitted with a probability proportional to CF. If it is closer to the gluon, it gets emitted with a probability proportional to CA over two. So that's kind of obvious um, because it should be that way. But the question was, in which frame do I have to measure? And the answer is in the original center of mass frame. Okay, and that is sketched in this long plane because what, what is meant by the fact that only this little triangle here is colored in blue is that um, um, I have to measure the angle in the original frame that corresponds to the fact that the separation between the gluon like radiation pattern and the quark like radiation pattern, which is kind of this part here and this part here, is precisely at this boundary. Okay, this happens when I measure in the original center of mass frame. All right. So the heuristic picture of this is that the gluon, the new gluon that I emit, if it lives at a kind of uh, larger angles um, than the opening angle between the emitting color dipole, which would be this one, it has a Compton wavelength that is not able to resolve the intrinsic structure of this color dipole. And this is something that is known from quantum electrodynamics as the so-called Chudakov effect. It is measured experimentally, so it is definitely valid. Uh, so that's the right picture to think of things, right? In that case, you can actually show by some, um, well, essentially I just showed it, but you can rewrite the color algebra in a nicer way and show in more general terms that the particle must be emitted of the, what we call mother particle in the shower language. And this is angular ordering, okay? Goes back to Marquezine and Weber in the, in the 80s. Okay, let's have a super quick look at phase space. Um, Stefan already showed you in the introductory lecture that phase space looks like this. And there is a nice paper by Wickling and Kayanti from, um, from Finland in, in the 70s that shows that uh, there is a very generic factorization property of that phase space that Stefan also mentioned in the introduction. And we can use this to factorize over a um, of our propagator term essentially and split off the one to two decay. Schematically, what this means is really the picture that I showed in the very beginning where you have a two to n process with two particles sticking out that I label one and two here. And you can factorize this, and this is an exact factorization. There is no approximation involved whatsoever. Okay. You can factorize this into an off-shell propagator and a one to two decay. Okay. Um, and the fact that it is off shell is reflected by this combined momentum here, which is the same as P1 plus P2. <clears throat> now, this two body phase space, two body decay, um, is, is can be written in terms of um, a solid angle integral and some constant. Okay. So we don't need to go into the details. The important thing is that there's a d cos theta d phi here. And I can map this cos theta integral to our light cone momentum fraction as so. Okay, um, that's just the definition for now, no deeper reason. Um, when I put everything together, I have, sorry, this is still something that I need to correct. Um, I have this factorization property. Sorry, this becomes an n minus one. Um, um, 
that my n particle phase space factorizes into an n minus one particle phase space off shell. I mark this because it's very important. Um, and um, the three variable integral because every particle has three phase space dimensions, right? That's so, all. So every phase space integral goes like d four p delta of p squared if everything is massless, and this is four dimension. Uh, sorry, three dimension. Now the fact that this is an off shell factorization. Um, means that we have to do something when we want to move to a parton shower language because a parton shower, as I spent a lot of time motivating yesterday, maps on-shell states to on-shell states. So what we do is to define a suitable recoil scheme. We already discussed this yesterday in some of the discussion groups um, in the evening. Uh, if you have more questions about this, uh, feel free to ask at any time because with the wrong recoil scheme, you can do a lot of damage. Um, so now we're putting everything together and we build an angular order pattern show. I am sticking to the soft radiation pattern and we will add the collinear terms um, sometime later. Okay. Or actually, I would gloss over them and you can look them up in the heuristic introduction. They are not important for the for the flow of argument here because the structure of the result, the basic structure. And the most important parts are contained in the semi-classical term. And this is very important to realize that the bulk of the radiation pattern that we describe in pattern showers is classical or semi-classical, okay? Which is something to think about actually. And you can discuss it as well. It's a good exercise um, for, for the recitation session. Um, okay, now we define our splitting function. Um, and uh, we already know our differential phase space. We rewrite again our, um, our light point momentum fraction in terms of um, scalar products. Um, so if you go to a suitable frame, you can actually uh, to the center of mass frame of, uh, of A and C, you can actually show that this is exact here. Um, and we put everything together. Um, so we have an SAC here that came from our phase space factorization. And we have a DZ here, which allows us to write part of this uh, iconal factor here as just a Z divided by one minus C. So after putting everything together, we get um, a DS over S DZ times a splitting function. And the leading part of that splitting function contains the two Z over one minus Z term um, that we discussed yesterday, which comes from here. And the rest is spin dependent terms that I'm glossing over for, more, for the moment. But they actually encapsulate the quantum nature of the, of the shower. Um, okay, so we perform a change of variables um, um, to something that we call Q tilde, which is um, the, um, the virtuality divided by Z times one minus Z. And um, you can write this um, down. And okay, as a reminder, we are splitting a particle into two particles, which in this notation are called A and C. Okay, so this energy is kind of the energy of the progenitor, which for, oh, sorry, of the mother, um, um, which for the moment I'm holding fixed. So the only variable thing here is really the angle between the two. And uh, because it's the only variable, essentially, this, this means that our ordering variable that I just met to is an angle. So this becomes an angular order charm. If you draw the contours of constant Q tilde in the Lund plane, uh, for that shower, you will get these functions here. Um, so you see that as I follow these contours, I just do a gradient flow here, basically. I'm drawing the, uh, the corresponding flow of the shower. It evolves in rapidity, um, but also in this kind of um, kind of almost collinear direction as I am close to the original um, to the original radiator. Okay, and otherwise I'm just evolving in rapidity. Um, so because this evolution runs in rapidity, it actually fills the back plane of the Lund diagram uh, with the correct color factor, which means CF, okay? 
So if I radiate a gluon here uh, from the original dipole, and then my evolution runs in rapidity away from that gluon, um, I will fill the back plane with the, with the right color factor. And the same, essentially, for the flow in this direction, I will fill it with CA over 2. And that's one of the key properties of uh, angular order showers. And this is why angular order showers will, uh, will give you, if they have the right recoil scheme, the correct um, um, resummation of uh, certain types of absorbables, which we call global absorbables. Not so for dipole showers. We do the same thing. We put this thing together for dipole showers. Um, again, we have the matrix element. We have our differential phase space. This time, we do a different mapping. We map the light from momentum fraction to the rapidity. And we rewrite, we write everything as an evolution in transverse momentum in the Lund plane and an integral in rapidity. And then we stick to the original radiator. We don't um, split it into a splitting function and uh, sorry, we just split off the, the transverse momentum anyhow. In that case, because we said that the matrix element is just a one over pt squared, the splitting function actually becomes a constant, which is very convenient, which is where the dipole showers come from. So if you look at this in the Lund plane, you find that the contours of constant evolution variable are these uh, lines and the evolution runs in pt. Okay, so it goes from top to bottom in the Lund plane. Because it goes from top to bottom, whenever I have emitted a gluon at this point, my, my dipole essentially changes to the, my original dipole, which was spent between quark and anti-quark, now changes to quark-gluon dipoles, which means, uh, uh, okay, and the, sorry, I'm effectively running the evolution in the center of mass frame of these new dipoles because of the Lorentz invariant in, uh, formulation of the entire thing. And this means, I'll discuss it in a minute, that I will fill part of the Lund, uh, of the back plane in the Lund diagram with the wrong color factors. This can be corrected, but by default, by default, it's not correct. Same is true for dipole light showers. I can do um, the partial fractioning that I alluded to before. Um, define a splitting function as so. Uh, choose an evolution variable, which ideally is just the transverse momentum in the Lund plane, but this time I'm not using rapidity. I stick to my um, um, light momentum fraction. And my splitting function becomes this guy here, which as Pt goes to zero, um, approaches what we know from before, that just the two Ca over one minus C, where only the one over C term is involved, the rest is just color factors, okay? Same as for the original dipole showers, this evolution runs from top to bottom in the Lund plane and is a random walk in rapidity, whereas the angular order evolution, as a reminder, runs from left to right and is a random walk in transverse momentum, uh, which is also an interesting thing to think about and to discuss in the recitation session. So it will have the same problems as the dipole evolution. By the way, I forgot to mention that the angular order evolution also has an additional problem, which you can see here, there is a small dead zone on the top that you don't fill. So you don't fill the full phase space if you use this particular type of evolution variable. And that has been causing people a lot of grief. Um, okay. Um, so I already mentioned that the dipole showers effectively evolve in the center of mass frame. And that means that this little area here, and we discuss, we can discuss more in the recitation session of why it looks exactly like this. It's essentially an equal split um, between the point where the first gluon is emitted and um, the point where that KT kind of uh, um, meets the boundary, um, and then an equal split in rapidity. Um, it fill, uh, sorry, the dipole shower fills kind of that part of the back plane in the Lund diagram with the wrong color factor because it effectively evolves in the center of mass frame of the dipole. And this has been realized by Yusta Yusterson in the early 90s and corrected um, by Leif in, in Ariadne since then. And it was also addressed in a more recent paper of which one of you is an author. Um, okay. Then um, this thing is not only a single emission 
problem, it's a multiple emission problem. So if you have multiple emissions, you will make multiple mistakes and you should correct them. I'm glossing over the details here because I would like to discuss two more things. One is universal higher order corrections that are typically included in the shower. Where do they come from? They come from, as a reminder, this is a virtual photon that splits into a QP bar pair, which I label I and J. So these universal higher order corrections come from a soft gluon that I emit and reabsorb on a different Wilson line. Um, these guys are effectively Wilson lines here. And this gluon decays by means of a collinear splitting function. Okay. But there have to be spin correlations because the gluon has a um, vector nature. So this is why the splitting function is not just the scalar, it has two Lorentz indices. And these two Lorentz indices are contracted with the Lorentz indices in the currents. And when I do so, um, I can write an approximation for these two matrix elements here for the quark and for the gluon part of this bubble insertions, if you will. Okay. Now, this looks very familiar to you. Um, this, these are the typical diagrams. If I forget about the kind of dressing with the Wilson line, these types of diagrams are the ones that are used to derive the running coupling. And in fact, the effect that we are looking at here is very similar uh, to what you, the calculation is very similar to what you would do for the running coupling. It's just at the next higher order in epsilon. In, in dimensional regularization. So let's have a look of, at where it comes from. Um, we use the notation of uh, Mike and uh, Stefano Catani from this uh, paper, from this subtraction paper, where they write the d-dimensional phase space as so. And the important point I would like you to focus on is that there is this factor, which is essentially a transverse momentum squared to the power of minus epsilon. This is what's written here. If you go to the kinematics of, uh, that I sketched yesterday, to the um, recall scheme that we discussed in the recitation session, can write, uh, you can write, you find that this is exactly the transverse momentum scaled by Q squared that I wrote here. Okay, And you can think about why that might be. Also a great point to discuss in the recitation session. Now, if I uh, perform a Laurent series expansion, which is this, this guy, and I take the pole term, which singles out my collinear poles, and then I expand this term, um, z to times one minus z to, to minus epsilon as a one minus epsilon logarithm of z times one minus z. And I take this guy here, together with this guy here, I will get something like a delta of y over epsilon, epsilon log z times one minus c. Okay. I cancel the epsilon and I find that this is a finite contribution. There's no pole there. Therefore, it is not a singularity I have to subtract. It is a true finite contribution that occurs in dimensional regularization times MS bar. And it has consequences. <clears throat> the consequences are that this will multiply the finite part of the splitting function uh, for the glue to QQ bar case. And it will multiply the finite part of the splitting function for the glue to glue glue case. And there will be some additional terms that come from a similar expansion, but I have to be very careful about how I do this. So I'm, I'm glossing over this. But these two terms together, and I am not dealing with those, only the blue terms together give you these two numbers. You may recognize these two numbers. And if you don't, it's a great point to bring up in the discussion session. <clears throat> because this thing is known as the famous K factor from the Catani, Marchesini, and Weber paper um, in the 90s. It is also known as the two loop cusp anomalous dimension. There's no magic behind this. It just emerges precisely from the structure that I just showed you. The only tricky part is the pi squared term. The pi squared term comes from here. And um, if you want to be exact about the pi squared term, you have to be careful. There's also a virtual correction, which we did not take into account, which comes from here. 
comes from a diagram that looks like this, which we have not calculated. And, all, and also there is a contribution from the original Wilson lines, which we have not taken into account. But all these terms together, because of the simplicity of the theory, are related to something that we call n equals four super young Mills theory. And you can actually use this to derive this term and just plug it in and you get the result for QCD. The actual manifestation of QCD are the rational terms here and there. Okay. Um, so this acts, and this is what I would like you to take away, as a local K factor for soft gluon emission. It is scheme dependent. It originates from the dimensional regularization and the MS bar subtraction scheme. And what's more, because it's scheme dependent, I can actually absorb it into another function that's also scheme dependent in our calculation, um, which is the running coupling. And this thing, absorbing this into the running coupling is called the so-called CMW scheme, okay? Um, this is why CMW is, is so convenient because it absorbs a certain universal part of the higher order corrections which originate in soft gluon emission times collinear gluon decay. Stefan, there is one hand raised, so maybe if you have okay. well, questions. Yes. Hi, uh, uh, thanks. I'm just, uh, I'm just a bit confused. The previous slide, uh, yes. why were we expanding the one over uh, y to the power one plus epsilon? Where did, where did that originate from? Good question. So what I, would, what I want to do here is I want to isolate the term that gives me a one over epsilon so I can cleanly separate out this logarithm. That's the reason. Does that make sense? Um, why, why isn't the pseudo rapidity? Or is it? Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> so why is, okay, I'm in the Catani Simo notation, okay? So this is S12 divided by Q squared. Um, oh yeah, it says it right there. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about this. Um, there's only a limited number of letters and <laughs> I change notation too often. I'm sorry about that. Does it make sense now? Um, I'm still a little bit confused as to what this delta function here is trying to do, this delta of y. Um, so you can think about this as projecting onto the collinear pole. There is a finite remainder from the order epsilon term in the integration of this collinear decay that, and when this one hits the collinear pole, um, you get a finite, finite contribution, but it only appears at order alpha squared. You don't see it at order alpha. However, you see it, <coughs> you actually also see it in this, in this subtraction framework by Catani and Simo. It's just an order epsilon term that at next to leading order, you can ignore this, but, at, but not at next to next to leading order. And because it's a logarithmically enhanced term, um, it is important because this will eventually multiply a logarithm that is of the form Sij over Si12 Sj12 when you have two gluon emission. And so in the double soft radiation pattern. And then when the one and two go collinear, it has the standard iconal form. Oh, sorry, it's not a logarithm here. Yeah, it is a logarithm, sorry. And, and then this is the reason why you actually have to evaluate because this is a logarithm of one over kt squared times q squared. Then this is the reason why you actually also have to evaluate alpha strong at kt squared, but more precisely not at kt squared because this is not kt squared, but it's mt squared. Another good point to discuss in the, in the recitation. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm kind of glossing over some of the details because I hope that you will discuss them with the, with the lecturers in the recitation and night care. But I'm just trying to give you the broad brush uh, overview of where these things come from. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so in the last three minutes, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I won't be able to go through the last couple of slides, but they are not so important from my point of view for, for what this lecture is supposed to achieve. Um, I, mean, I mean, we can go over, we have a little time of flex if you need. Okay, I'll, I'll try and, and make the main points and we can discuss the rest in the recitation session. 
um, we're going to discuss the connection to analytic reexamination. And some of you know this already, and some of you may have heard about this, and, and some of you may be just curious of why I'm doing this at all, because it's a horrible mess. And let me just motivate it first, okay? Um, we have kind of seen um, that angular order potentials are good. And in general, they are just proven to be NLL accurate for certain observables, which we call global observables for reasons that I'm not going to discuss. Provided that the CMW scheme is used that I just introduced. So that's nice. Um, so why don't we use them in general? And they have several problems. They have the problem that they don't fill the full phase space. They have the problem that alpha strong has to be evaluated at the transverse momentum, which I just said, but they evolve in, in Q tilde and so on and so forth. So it's not convenient, kind of. So we would like to use other showers, more dipole type showers. But we don't know whether they are NLL accurate. So how do we quantify this, whether they are NLL accurate? And, and what does NLL accuracy mean in the first place? OK, so let's discuss this for a well-established observable, which is the thrust in the plus e minus. And we use a method which, for the moment, doesn't play a role where it comes from, but it's a generic method for NLL resummation, which was introduced by Gavin Salam and collaborators. Um, it's a very nice and convenient method because it's connected to this angular ordering picture um, and has its origins essentially also in, in angular ordered or um, um, color coherent evolution. Um, the reason why I'm discussing this at all is because we will find that the relevant limit in which we have to compare pattern showers and uh, um, analytic resummation is the limit that alpha strong goes to zero. And I'm not sure about you, but when I heard this for the first time, I thought, what the heck? Um, it sounds pretty unphysical to me. Um, so it's definitely worth a closer look. Because you will encounter, you may or I think you will encounter this in future discussions and future workshops, and you should know what people are discussing about. Um, OK, so let's look at Lund plane, and let's look at the contribution of a single emission to the thrust observable. So we have the Lund plane. We have an emission somewhere that opens a new phase space, OK? And this emission has a transverse momentum and a rapidity. And then I'm trying to calculate the transverse, sorry, the thrust for the, just this emission. And this is in this language phrased as some observable, which has the name V. There is no deeper reason for that. Um, and if we write this single emission contribution to the thrust, so we have a Q and a Q bar. And we have a gluon emission, and this co contributes to the thrust essentially by contributing um, a little momentum kick in the negative direction. And you can phrase this as so. Okay, it's kT times e to the minus rapidity normalized over something. And we're not calculating thrust itself, we're calculating V, which is one minus thrust. Okay, now let's write a shower that evolves in thrust. And we already discussed yesterday that showers can evolve in different uh, variables. Um, if we write it in terms of light form momentum fraction, that would be kT over 1 minus c. And this we call our evolution variable psi. Then we can write our single emission pattern as so. Um, the psi over psi, that's just the generic logarithmic structure that comes from the propagator. Um, alpha s, which has to be taken at kt squared, as I said before, times the classical or semi-classical radiation pattern times some spin-dependent terms, which are not logarithmically enhanced, um, apart from the one over xi, but not in, they are not enhanced in z, times some angular ordering. This is angular ordering. Um, this thing is quantum. And this is kind of classical. <laughs> OK, now we have z limits that we need to integrate in. See, these are the rapidity limits that I, uh, um, that I uh, talked about before. And now we're trying to make an approximation. We're only trying to take terms into account that are either log double logarithmic or single logarithmic. We are not taking constants or anything else. In that approximation, you can integrate this out. And this is one of the exercises. Um, you can actually replace the transverse momentum here with a constant. And only for the leading term, you have to take the theta function into account. Otherwise, you just put the integrals from 0 to 1. Um, OK. And um, then you can go ahead and write your full 
thrust distribution, which comes from multiple emissions, as the Sudakov suppression for the first um, no emission, basically. So this is your e to the minus r of v times a function f of v, which incorporates anything that happens afterwards, basically. Okay. This is just the way the things are split up. Um, so because you have a first emission that has a contribution to the observable, which we call V1. And this V1, because I, you have an ordered evolution, um, sets limits here and there on all the subsequent emissions. And I just have to sum over all possible subsequent emissions. Okay. Overall, I'm not allowed to, con to produce an observable that is larger than the value I want to measure, which I call little v. Okay, now um, technically what's being done in order to make this calculable analytically is that for the Sudakov part, a Taylor expansion is performed to extract this radiator that I had on the previous slide, okay? Um, in order to write it, have the result in the form of the equation above. Okay, then what's left is this term. Okay, I should say, how, what I mean by Taylor expansion. So we expand in the part on shower cutoff, which is this little epsilon. This is the part on shower cutoff. Okay. And we Taylor expand in this. And this is why we get this guy. Okay. There's an epsilon in there. Okay. And then we write it in form of the equation up here, which gives us a definition of this function f. And now the trick is that this function f is purely next to leading logarithmic that has no leading logarithm. So it has no double logarithms basically. And as I said before, technically speaking, it just accounts for the multiple emission effects. All right. Now we want to make this calculable. In order to make it calculable, we have to make two approximations. Um, sorry, we have to make one assumption and one approximation. The assumption is that the observable is infrared and collinear safe, recursively infrared and collinear safe. So then I can replace, uh, sorry, I can scale the phase space integrals as so. And then I have to send the observable to zero um, while holding alpha strong times log V fixed. What that means technically is if you look at the Lund plane, and I told you before that the shower is a fractal in the Lund plane. What that means is that we hold the scaling dimension of that fractal fixed while we take the limit. In other words, we don't change the physics in the shower while we take the limit that the observable takes on a small value. And only in that particular approximation, we can analytically calculate that function f. Um, and it takes on a very convenient form, which is this one. So all in all, this is a very complicated procedure. What I would like you to take away is this. When we perform the limit, we hold the scaling dimension of the fractal fixed. And we essentially don't take the alpha strong to zero limit. We take the limit that the observable goes to zero. Okay, actually, this is the one over B here. Sorry about that. And then that limit makes everything calculable and makes it simple and clean, no next to next to leading log contaminations to, to the F function. And um, this is the origin of the much discussed alpha S to zero shower benchmark, where we compare next to leading log with pattern showers. Um, okay, and since I'm already over time, Anything that goes beyond that, we can discuss in the um, in the recitation and um, nightcap. Um, let me just mention that there was also a momentum mapping issue that was found um, by Gavin Salam and collaborators, which occurs when I have two emissions which are strongly ordered in transverse momentum, and I look at the absolute correlation between those. So I'm looking kind of at the bottom of this plot. This should be a flat distribution in this heat map, but it is not. 
So that has been corrected and they have proven that in various um, recoil schemes, you actually get the next to leading lock result okay. And then Mike Zemo and collaborators have looked at different recoil schemes and checked how well they actually describe the finite region. Um, and this is very important because a pattern shower does not only operate in the alpha S to zero limit, but also um, is supposed to describe data in the measurable region. So we can discuss more about that in the nightcap. Um, to summarize, I, I just want to say that pattern showers are still a topic of very intense research, even after 40 years, um, because they are expected to describe real world data in all kinds of scenarios, and they are not always in a clean theoretical limit. And um, in order to solve some of the problems, we will have to extend them to higher perturbative orders eventually. And this will wanna be one of the prime uh, objectives of the shower community in the following years. Okay, very, yeah, very good, thing, Stefan, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and take a break now and begin at the half hour. And again, um, uh, and we had a few questions, but we'll have opportunity this evening to address more. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, there's one from, there's a question from Rock. Um, can I just- Oh, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, no, go. sorry, that was just me forgetting to lower my hand. Oh, okay, it's all right. No worries. Um, 